Good. Sounds great. We're live and uh, we're kicked off. Uh, welcome everybody who's uh, watching and with us. And uh, as uh, many of you know, and some of you don't, my name is Eric Edmeads, and I've got Dr. Lauren Cordain here with us today. And uh, I thought I'd offer a little preamble as to why I would want to do this interview and why I'm excited about it. And that is that um, certainly many of you who have uh, seen me speak on the topic before or um, have done any of our programs will know that I'm a, a big fan of um, I'm a big fan of the concept of returning to the past and taking a look at evolutionary design and, 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 and you know, getting some clues about health and longevity that way. And when I first started on this journey as a young man, um, I really felt largely alone. I, you know, I was, it was the early, it was 1991, 92, and I, I, I kind of started, you know, thinking a lot about this stuff. And then one day I walked into a bookstore and I saw this book, The Paleo Diet, and I, I opened it up and I was like, it, it was like this unbelievable uh, wash over of validation that I wasn't a nut bar, you know, that, that maybe there was, maybe we were on the right track in some way. And, and also a tremendous um, refinements of some of my ideas and thoughts on the topic. And, and so I've been, I've been following uh, uh, Dr. Cordain for a long, long time and I've, I've been a big fan. And so I'm really glad to uh, have him here to, to, uh, to chat with today. And uh, so uh, Dr. Cordain, thanks very much for joining us. Well, Eric, it's uh, my pleasure. I'm, I'm glad that uh, you and I could uh, get together. Absolutely. And where, where are you right now, just so we can locate everybody geographically? I'm in Fort Collins, Colorado. So Fort we're about, Colorado. Well, about yeah. 60 miles north of uh, Denver. Gotcha. Gotcha. I always think uh, Alexander Graham Bell would be pretty impressed with what we can pull off these days. I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here in uh, uh, Amsterdam Central having had a slightly late plane and a slightly late train and literally walked into my room in time to, to get us started here. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, uh, it's really amazing what we can do electronically and, and how we just kind of go all over the world. Uh, so yeah, again, it's my pleasure to be able to speak to you and your group. Sounds great. So let, let me give you a little, I, I know we chatted a little bit on email and I, I, by the way, thank you so much for sending that piece through on the Floris bad skull. Um, you know, uh, for background for, for those of you who are, I, you know don't know what I'm talking about, um, my, uh, my dad's grandfather was a guy named uh, T.F. Dreyer, and he discovered the Florispad skull, which some people call Homo hemlii and others call Homo sapiens archaic. And it represents a really, you know, to me, uh, a real inspiration. I, as, a, as, a young, as a young great-grandson, I, I, that, I really um, was caught up in the imagination of what it must have been like to live back then. And that's long before I was thinking about health or any of that kind of stuff. Just, I, I just had that fascination in general terms. And, and so years later when I started, um, you know, I had this bizarre realization that, you know, every species on earth appears to have a diet except people. And if we ever want to, you know, it's like if we ever want to figure out what's going on with a captive animal, all we have to do is go look at the way it, it lived in nature. And if we can duplicate that, then all of a sudden it's not getting sick in the zoo so much. And, and it, it hit me, well, wait a minute, we should be able to do that for people. And then I started thinking about my grandfather and his work and, and then bam, the paleo diet comes along. So, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, I'm really into this stuff. It's been over a 20 year journey for me. And so I've, I've got, to, I, I, and a lot of my clients have some really neat questions for your uh, point of view on a couple of things. And. I, you know where I'd love to start if it's okay with you, and I, I sort of know a little bit of the story, but for everybody else, you know, I know what it was like for me to stumble onto this realization, and, and it, it was really simple. I was reading an article, you know, about elephants in circuses and zoos, and 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 they, you know, how they only lived six or seven or ten years, and 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 then one day when they, you know, this is of course a hundred years ago, and and then one day they realized that elephants in the zoo were living like seventy years. And, and all the zoo and circus owners became deeply concerned about the elephants or their balance sheets and figured, hey, how could we get 70 years out of our elephants? And of course, what did they do? Looked at the way the wild elephants were living, looked at the way the captive elephants were living, made some changes. And the thing that really bothered me about that article was that it kept referring to the elephant's wild diet. And to me, that was a grammatical you know, screw up. There's no such thing as the elephant's wild diet. There's the elephant's diet. <laughs> And that's what got me to this, holy cow, there's a human diet. And uh, so I'd love to know, how did you, you know, did you slip in the shower, bang your head, wake up one day and come up with this? Or, you know, we were, what, what was your story? Well, I kind of like you, I had one of those aha moments. And uh, I've always been interested in health and fitness. And um, I was a track athlete in college. And 
I worked as a lifeguard on a major beach in Lake Tahoe. So I've always had an interest in this, and uh, I ended up getting a, a PhD in exercise physiology in 1981 from the University of Utah. And so I promptly got a job at uh, Colorado State University as a professor there. And part of uh, being a professor at a Division I research institute is to have uh, a research focus. And so um, my focus Well, guys, for all my uh, talk of how impressed Alexander Graham Bell would be with technology these days, uh, I'm growing less impressed by the moment. Somehow it looks like Google Hangouts just uh, crashed completely on us. I've lost uh, Dr. Cordain for a moment. We're going we're gonna to try and get him back. So hang tight. Um, thank you for hanging tight. I see most of you are still with us. So hold on. We're, we're, we're working to solve the issue. Okay. I just heard from their office that there's some issue in Colorado and they've had some kind of internet crash so they're trying to fix that and they are planning to be back with us very very soon hang tight hold on everybody incidentally assuming we get this uh, back on track here which obviously we hope um, there is a chat box on the right hand side that you can certainly um, write any questions that you guys have about anything relative to paleo uh, wild fit any of that kind of stuff because uh, um, this is a real you know cool and, and, and uh, uh, you know valuable opportunity. And if any of you guys want to actually jump in uh, and enjoy the call with us um, and actually uh, um, ask your question live, just pop, pop that in the chat room and Jessica or Dan will communicate with you if we're going to be able to make that happen. And if they can, they'll send you a link that'll let you jump in. Anyway, hang tight. We're, uh, we're working on solving this problem. Hold on. I'm not sure what's going on. We got a, a, a quick message saying that there was some uh, internet challenge they were having in, uh, in Colorado. So hopefully they're going to sort that out and be able to rejoin us again. If not, you know, I, I just thought, you know, I, we're all here together. And um, what we're going to do is uh, change this up a little bit until we get Dr. Cordain back. And, and so I think what we can do instead is I obviously recognize some names in there. We have some of our wild fit coaches and some other people that are around. Um, and so what I'd like to suggest is uh, if any of you, matter of fact, I'm going to pop a link right into the window here into the chat window. And if you, um, let's just see here. If you look over into the chat window, hang on. And you click that link, you can actually join right in. And uh, I know that some of you had post questions in earlier and that those questions, uh, um, uh, it looks like the system lost them, but our team captured some of them. So. When we get Dr. Cordain back, we'll uh, we'll answer those. While I may have some of my own answers about those things, I know your questions in that case were intended for him. So we'll wait and see if we get that going on. In the meantime, um, I I guess that I think the most important thing here for me from a from a background perspective and why I'm so fascinated with the work of Dr. Cordain, uh, Rob Wolf, and some of the other real uh, um, you know sort of pillars of the whole paleo movement is that. I, I, I arrived at a point in my life where I recognized there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that the era we need to be paying the most attention to is the Paleolithic. That, that's the period of time where you know, our, our physiology, our dietary systems, our instincts and cravings, our, our, um, you know, our, our lifestyles were formed and evolved. And then, of course, in this newer period or the Neolithic where, where we start looking at uh, – uh, wheat and, and dairy and other injections into our diet, things really begin to change pretty rapidly. And so for me, the debate is never really about that. And, and what, what is interesting to me is that within this sort of paleo world, there, um, there is a lot of conversation about, you know, what really is paleolithic? Because of course, nobody actually has a time machine. Uh, well, I mean, if you do, let me know, I'd like to borrow it. But for the time being, it appears nobody has a time machine. And so, uh, and so when we go back and look at, you know, fossil record and, 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 and look at what archaeologists and, and, and anthropologists are telling us about that era, um, it, it's, it, it sometimes is guesswork. And so, for example, there are a number of people who are, um, you know, who are uh, questioned, for example, what percentage of our diet should be made up of, of meat? And there are people who are asking, well, wait a minute now, you know, how, how, how fast is evolution? I mean, if we've been having milk for six or 7,000 years, then why not have it now? And, and, and so I think, and, and, you know, there's been lots of questions about um, honey and fruit and, and sugar and that kind of stuff. And, and so one of the real 
big questions for me, or one of the ways that I try to answer these questions is experientially. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, twofold. One is really testing it out from an evolutionary biology perspective. So, you know, when we take a look and say, well, you know, um, does sugar really create hunger in people? Because that seems like a bad idea, really. And it doesn't seem functional that, that sugar makes people hungry. And then, but what we have to do is go back in time and, and say, well, wait a minute now. We right now it seems like that's a design flaw. Right now that seems like a really bad idea. But if you were to go back a hundred thousand years and live in nature, then maybe you'd have a different point of view. Maybe you'd have a different perspective. Because if we take two populations from that time era and say, all right, well, one population, you know, whenever they eat sugar, it makes them want to eat more sugar, and the other population doesn't have that. Well, you know what that to me suggests is that the population that does not have that inclination is much more likely to uh, zoom off and, you know, have a, eat a little bit of fruit when it comes in season, uh, you know, not be particularly bothered if they bump into honey, you know, it's like uh, not that strong a craving for sugar. And, and, and if sugar doesn't make them more hungry, even if they eat a little, then they'll walk away. On the other side, the other population, they, they have a different reaction. They eat a little bit of fruit and it stimulates hunger. It stimulates, a, um, you know, an appetite, which makes them want to eat more, which stimulates more, which makes them want to eat more, and so on. And so, um, you know, well, what would be the advantage of that? Well, I think the advantage is if you then enter into winter or deep drought, it's really clear. There's a massive advantage to the people that ate as much as was possibly available to eat when it was, you know, hard to come by. And so it strikes me that those people would have more breeding opportunities and would be more likely to survive. So, so that's typically how I've tried to answer questions when they've come up um, with some variance between one person that, you know, that's speaking about one aspect of paleo and, and, and someone else that's uh, covering another aspect. Um, so I, I'm, um, I've really tried to do it that way. And then the other way is, as many of you know, actually going, you know, going and saying, all right, I don't have a time machine, but I can get a 747. <laughs> and a 747 or a similar plane can take me uh, you know, into Africa where there are still people that are living a hunter gatherer and nomadic existence. And, and I, I want to be clear, I don't mean traveling to South America to go see how South, South American Indians are living or to go to, you know, Northern Canada and, and, or, or Northern Russia and look at how, you know, the, the, the Northern people are living in the Eskimos and so on, or, or, or for that matter to go and check out the Aboriginals on Australia, because all of those people are transplants to that land. And so where I think the most valuable lessons come from is, is really going back to where, you know, human origins begin and, 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 and getting, a, getting a glimpse at the, the hunter-gatherers that are living there and, to, it, to my mind, are the most, um, uh, you know, are the most uh, representational of our, of our past. And so, again, when I've done that uh, and gone off and spent time with the Hadza, I've been really fascinated to, you know, to be able to get a sense in, in the course of a week how much meat they really do or, do or don't eat or what their reaction is uh, when they have the opportunity to have honey and how often honey comes along or, you know, how often they're, they're getting uh, carbohydrates. It was something very fascinating. Of course, I'm going now shortly in a few weeks here to go and do another stay with the Hadza. And I put out on social media, do you have a question for, a, for the Hadza? And by the way, if you do, pop it on my Facebook page or send it to me on Twitter because I've collected a long list of these questions to ask them. But one thing I want to point out to you, some of the questions I've got, and got that I've received have been really interesting. And what I, by interesting, what I mean is they show what a uh, lack of um, perspective we have on what it's really like to be hunter-gatherer. Like people are asking me, like, at what age do they learn to read or write? I'm not kidding. Like, you know, and, and I want you to think about this. And if that was your question, I don't, I would have asked the same question before I met them. I mean, we, we don't. We don't, we, we, we don't think in these terms, but reading and writing is irrelevant to them. They can read the ground. They can, they can read the tracks. They can read the seasons. They can read the plant, uh, you know, uh, plant species and leaf patterns, but uh, words and numbers just, just don't really have a lot of meaning to them. And, and so it's really quite fascinating to be able to go and spend time with them, visit with them, and get a sense of what their life is like. Not because I think we should live that way, but because there are clues in the way they live uh, that can help us unlock some mysteries around the way we live now and why our cravings and why our instincts are a certain way. So with that in mind, um, I think maybe. We're there we go. Oh, look at that. Right. <laughs> okay. So let me see here.
Eric, can you hear me? I can perfectly. I can. I was okay, just, yeah. I was saying earlier for all my talk of how impressed uh, uh, um, you know uh, Alexander Graham Bell would be. I'm thinking now, not so much. Yeah, that's uh, the guy that uh, runs our marketing here. The the CEO. He came in and I told him the story, and he says, "Well, uh, that's probably why we went down." <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah, so it, it apparently is all over Fort Collins. Or, I don't know, somebody stepped full of plug or something. <laughs> you know, it happened on my end as well. So it wasn't just you. It was simultaneous. My whole connection went at the exact same moment. So it was really odd. Uh, huh. but we had uh, our, uh, you know, A lot of people stayed faithful to us and they're still engaged. So that's good. And I, I'm not sure exactly where we lost you, but you were giving me the, you know, how did you stumble yeah. upon the idea um, that we needed to start looking at the Paleolithic? Well, I mentioned, uh, you know, the year was 1987, so I was uh, 36 years old at the time. I'm 64 now. So uh, you say you've been doing it quite a while. I have too. So I've been wow. involved since uh, 87, and I, I, I read Boyd Eaton's original paper that was published in 1985 in the New England Journal. I read it two years later, and as I mentioned, I went through and I got all the cross-references, and I had a personality type that just you know, accumulate and compile all this stuff. And so I started putting it all together. And like I said, it's you know, like doing a, a jigsaw puzzle. Um, yeah. I started to, I saw the outside pieces and then started placing everything together. And then finally I, I got up enough courage because in that day and age, we didn't have the internet. And so I finally got up enough courage to call Boyd Eaton on the telephone on a landline. And he's a, uh, a working radiologist. So he was uh, actually on his lunch hour, and he spoke to me for the entire hour. Wow. And at the, at the end of the, you know, when you're two people that are just totally into this, at the end of the hour, he said, wow, it sounds to me like you know more about this than I do. <laughs> that, was about, that was about the best compliment I think I've ever had in my professional career. So one thing led to another, and uh, I invited him to come to Colorado State University and give a lecture. And... Uh, um, he invited me to go to Greece uh, and give a lecture on the, the topic. And uh, I met Artemis Simopoulos and many other famous uh, nutritional mm -hmm. scientists when I was there. And I suddenly went from being a small fish in a small pond to kind of operating internationally and, and writing papers. And, and then finally, my wife convinced me to uh, write a popular book because I, you know, a scientist, and that's all I was really interested in was just writing scientific papers. And so she convinced me to. Uh, write a popular book. I ended up getting a, an agent, a literary agent, uh, that kind of showed me the ropes. And the first book came out in 2002. I remember. And, and Paleo really didn't, uh, you know, go viral until, I want to say maybe 2007 or 2008, maybe even later, 2009. And now it's, uh, it's just mind-boggling how it's become a worldwide concept. I was I was really blown away that it didn't catch on like right away. I really was. I mean, to me, it was like I'm looking around going, guys, don't you see what just happened here? You know, like it was it was it was so plain to me because, uh, you know, of course, you're in seven when you're having these initial thoughts. My biggest worry was, should I have pineapple on my pizza or not and finish high school? You know, and, <laughs> and, and it, it wouldn't be until I was until 91 or 92 that I started asking the right questions that that kind of led me to that conclusion. So when your book, and I also saw Eaton's stuff, and it was like, oh my God, it was like, so when your book came out, I, I was shocked. And then, and then, and then Atkins, I mean, you know, it, it was like, people would say, well, it works, it works. And I'm like, yeah, it works because it's taking one principle from nature it's, and abusing that principle to get a really great short-term result. But man, we, you got to look at the whole picture. So I was, I was really yeah. surprised that it took so long. I, you know, I was kind of surprised as well, actually, um, you know, this idea, evolution through natural selection, obviously isn't Boyd Eaton's or mine or anybody else's. It started <laughs> off with Charles Darwin, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a gift to humanity. That's what it is. And so the application of evolutionary principles to human diet, is may, as crazy as it sounds, is it really didn't even get going until Boyd's paper. I mean, we had... The, the knowledge and the information, but the nutritional and medical community wasn't on board. And now, I mean, there are hundreds, thousands of scientific papers that utilize that organizational template. 
Yeah. And the nutrition community, I think, is a little bit slow in, in adopting it, but uh, you, you know, well, they keep there, deny it. You know, without getting too deep into conspiracy theory and that kind of stuff, the reality <laughs> is self-care is not profitable. Yeah, you know, there's, uh, you're right. There's not a whole lot of money to be made um, by when there's no middleman. If you go to uh, a farmer's market and the, the producers bring their food there and you buy it directly from them, um, you know, there's not a huge amount of money to be made with this. And so uh, people don't necessarily need supplements. Uh, they just need healthful food. And yeah. that's really the simplicity of the concept. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it is it's it's shocking to me the simplicity of the message and that 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 it's in, uh, in debate. When I was kind of filling time with our little t technical glitch, one of the things I was saying is that I, I, I'm I've arrived at a point. You know, we still we still refer to evolution as being a theory, um, you know, and and that's just a matter of uh, you know perspectives and time and that sort of thing, I suppose. But to me, the the uh, the idea that the human diet, um, you know, stems from that that era of, of human evolution, it's not, that's not under debate to me at all. What might be under debate at times is what was the Paleolithic really like? You know, of course, you know, we're, we're, I think that's where things get a little bit more um, difficult, but I, I just don't see how anybody could refute the idea that we lived, you know, this much of our, uh, our time one way. And that's where our instincts evolved, our digestive fluids evolved, our nutritional requirements evolved. How could you debate that truth? Maybe you could then debate, well, I think the Paleolithic looked like this, and I think it looked like that. Maybe that's a debate. Well, you know, I, you know it comes down to semantics and, and terminology, is that maybe uh, when Boyd called it Paleolithic nutrition, and I called it the Paleo diet, we coined those terms, and, and maybe we should have just called it the, the non-junk food diet. Yeah. <laughs> it probably, you know, it probably um, wouldn't have resonated um, and I, I think, you know, I went out right away. I mean, not right away, but, you know, when the Internet started becoming interesting and, and enough to me, I went out and bought the human diet.com. I've never really used it, but it was like that to me. It, that's what we're really talking about here. And uh, because, it, like I said before, every living thing on Earth has a diet. So do we. <laughs> well, I think one of the interesting uh, ways of viewing this, and I, I wrote a paper in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2005, called The Origins and Evolution of the Western Diet, Health Implications for the 21st Century. And what I did, I was the lead author, and I, Boyd was on it, and a bunch of other famous uh, well-known nutritional scientists were co-authors with me. And one of the ways that we looked at this was to kind of go backwards in time and take away the foods that we now are staples. And as you go backwards in time, from 100 years to 1,000 years to 10,000 years, um, <clears throat> what we find is that the foods that comprise 70% of our calories in the typical Western diet didn't even exist. Yeah. And as crazy as it, it sounds is that four foods, uh, refined grains, refined sugars, dairy products, um, and refined vegetable oils comprise 70% of the calories in the U.S. and the, the European diet. And so when you get rid of those, what's left? Well, um, wild living foods, and uh, it's pretty uh, nearly impossible to for humans to eat wild living foods and, and develop nutritional deficiencies or insufficiencies. So, uh, you know, we can argue all we want, and, and I know that archaeologists and anthropologists get involved in this, and uh, you know, they say, well, we don't really know what people were eating back. Okay, so I don't know if we've lost you again. Okay, so hopefully they'll uh, rejoin us again here shortly. Um, uh, Charlotte, I'm looking at the question that you posted earlier, and um, let's see. What advice can you offer to the support of digestion elimination in the transition to a real food diet? Yeah, you know, Charlotte, that's a really good question, and I hope we do get to put that to Dr. Cordain. It's something we try to address a lot in the way we um, the way we constructed the the WildFit Challenge and. And that is to recognize that our uh, digestive systems in the end um, become less and less functional because of the way most people are eating. And so the, the natural you know, um, ability to produce the right uh, digestive fluids and, and all the you know, organisms that are involved in digesting stuff are negatively impacted, of course, by all the chemicals and refined sugar. And, and, and so that becomes really difficult. And then 
So what happens the minute somebody switches, like if you, if you, if you ask somebody to switch like on a Thursday and, and, you know, and, and then switch suddenly Friday, they're going to start eating healthy. Well, is their body even capable of making that transition uh, instantly? Well, the first thing is I would say, well, there can be no harm in doing that. But I do think there are certain things uh, that we can do to, to smooth out that transition. Most of them do not have to do with helping the digestive system. They have to do with helping our emotions and our instincts and our cravings. And so, for example, um, it, you know, in our program, we, we have created a very uh, staged process of, of helping people move off foods so that they're giving up foods, not that they still want, that, that they've actually changed their association with and no longer want. And I find that to be the bigger issue than the, uh, uh, you know, than, than getting their digestive systems um, up to speed. Because for the most part, unless somebody's done a really significant amount of damage, your digestive system is going to kind of go, oh, wow, nutrition. I remember what that's all about. And over time, it will naturally bring itself back into balance. When you consider, you know, eating grains, refined grains that have been, uh, you know, ground up and and so all of the chemicals and natural chemicals that are inside grains i'm not even talking about pesticides and stuff i just mean the grains natural defenses against getting digested well those 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 things are definitely going to have a ne negative impact on your digestion and once those things are gone then your digestive system is going to you know kind of naturally come back into speed um i'm not sure if that addresses your question at all and hopefully if we get dr cordian back we can put that to him um, I, I saw somebody asking uh, a question in the original chat about um, uh, the quantity of meat, and I'm really hoping we get to put that question to him because, um, you know, my my observation is is that we how we might derive that answer as to how much meat people should eat will actually depend largely on which people we're looking at and when, and quite often I think that people are uh, comparing. You know, for example, when, when, when people arrived in, in Europe, when people arrived in the Americas, when they first arrived to those places, um, the animals that were living in those places, oh, hang on, we're back. All right. We're back. <laughs> I'm getting extremely good at filling dead air. I, I'm going to have a career in uh, television very soon, so you can feel it, or politics, one of the two. <laughs> All right, I'm back. Good deal. Good so, deal. It was the Alexander Graham Bell comment that's causing all this. Yeah, it's all that. Bad, bad karma I created right at the beginning. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, I, I think uh, it's amazing that I'm talking to the great-grandson of the guy that found that very famous skull. I, and, uh, you know, I, I wish I could take any credit at all. My, some of my DNA is responding to the praise. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I that's amazing. That his, his old house, uh, if I remember the family lore correctly, his old house is now the National Museum in Bloemfontein, which I've been to, and that's where the skull resides, uh, despite huge attempts by people like UCLA and stuff to buy it back in the day. He says, no, it stays here. So I, I, well, I probably could have lived a much more economically fluid life if he had accepted their offer. Uh, well, that's probably where it should stay. It should stay in the area where it was found. Oh, I, and, I agree. You know, it belongs to, uh, it's a, an artifact that belongs to the world, but it was found in South Africa. So yeah, amazing. Uh, and, and you know, I, I sent you that paper showing that uh, it had been redated uh, to about yeah. 275,000 years ago. So that was a very interesting uh, time in human evolution. And clearly 275,000 years ago, they weren't eating junk food. No, they certainly weren't. Or, or if they did, it was junk food was very, I mean, one of the things we work with our clients a lot on is the concept of seasonality. And, and so, you know, you have all these diets like fruit is evil. Oh, if fruit's so evil, <laughs> fruit, uh, you know, and, and our, our view is fruit, fruit is absolutely not evil unless you somehow move to a planet where fruit is available every single day, then fruit would become pretty evil. Yeah. So I, you know, it's a, uh, it's it's a pretty uh, basic concept, but uh, like anything else, so many people have become involved. Uh, you know, uh, there's all kinds of different ideas and opinions on what constitutes a healthful contemporary quote unquote paleo diet. So it's uh, it's fractionated, and um, as it should, I think that. Uh, this concept is it's mentioned. tough to say i i question that issue of of um you know of uh, like i i I've, I've sometimes lamented i i i got that you're that you were um brilliant with your discovery and 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 academic and then you created this thing and it kind of you know and everybody started taking the name and running away with it and, and i see the benefit in that but at the same time i i think one of the areas that struggle is like you know clients come to us at times and they are and and they've attempted to be paleo 
but then they've gotten confused because you've got one paleolithic author that says dairy products are acceptable and another one that says they're not and another one that says you know you should be eating 50 percent of your calories from meat and another one says 10 percent and you know so i, I on one level i kind of i think it would have been really neat to just kind of control that but then but then that assumes you were right about everything and I'm going to guess over the years, there's times where people have highlighted something to you and you've thought, oh, you know, maybe I should think about that. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't claim to, uh, you know, have an inside track on this. I, uh, you know, I, I pursued an idea uh, over the course of most of my adult life. And um, as I mentioned, I was primarily interested in this as a scientific concept. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I... I'm so happy that it is uh, the popular books and the popular writings have, uh, you know, influenced so many people in a positive manner in terms of their health and well-being. That's, yeah. that's really what it's all about. So uh, let me ask you something. I, I you know, and I, it, it's a it's a topic that we deal with a lot with our clients and and people ask a lot relative to to any any programs that are relative to that that are related to kind of paleo. If I remember correctly, and I, it's been a long time, but if I remember correctly, you're you roughly recommend about thirty five percent of thirty five percent of diet uh, or calorie uh, calorie intake from um, from meat. Is that about right? Um, actually, that was Boyd Eaton's original uh, estimate, right. um, and that came out of uh, an erroneous uh, statistical interpretation of. Uh, what was referred to as the ethnographic atlas and um, the ethnographic atlas is what uh, a number of scientists have used to estimate the, the plant to animal subsistence ratio so uh, what i did is uh, i corrected that in in 2000 um, we went in and put the ethnographic atlas on an excel spreadsheet and did the uh, appropriate calculation, and it turned out it was actually completely opposite to um, what Eaton's original estimate was. And the reason for that was is that they failed to put in um, fish food with meat. And so the ethnographic atlas actually separates the two out. And if you combine um, meat and fish food, uh, then what we see is a, a mean value that is actually about 65% animal, 35% plant. So uh, Boyd actually <clears throat> got it wrong. <laughs> Interesting. And, uh, yeah, so we, we corrected that. And anybody, nowadays, anybody can get the ethnographic atlas online and anybody can do that analysis. So um, there are 229 hunter-gatherer societies that are listed uh, in there. And... Uh, so we did that compilation and uh, it's been replicated uh, a number of times in the scientific literature. So, uh, but you know, I, humans, um, you know, we're, we're very opportunistic and uh, we can eat a lot of things. And I think that's, uh, yeah. th that's the point is that there was really no single quote unquote paleo diet, uh, diet varied by latitude, by, ecologic niche, uh, season, uh, food availability, and what have you. But uh, if animal foods were available, they were generally preferred over plant foods because of a concept called optimal foraging theory, meaning yeah. that uh, any animal that goes out and, and forages for food, they've got to take in more calories than they expend. And uh, so plant foods, at least for humans, um, are much less nutrient dense in terms of their calories. There's a few that aren't like nuts and, you know, seeds and, and, and the, the effort involved in nuts and seeds. I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried to open an almond, but uh, <laughs> without equipment. Yeah. So it, it, it is. And uh, <clears throat> same thing with, uh, with optimal foraging theory, um, uh, large animals are preferred over small animals. So if you yeah. can run around and try to catch 150 mice, um, it energetically is not a, a very good uh, feedback. So one of my, one of my uh, kind of earliest insights into this was my, my father. So my father was a very big fan of his father or his grandfather's work. And uh, so my father, who's actually trained as a lawyer and, and so on, but really 
he's one of those guys who went to law school because that's what his parents wanted. But the, in reality, what he was was a scientist. And so you know, he wrote a book, which uh, I'm sure you'd find fascinating. Uh, you, you can find it at megafauna.com. And uh, it was really a, a book that's all about human migration and the, and the massive extinctions that, that humans contributed to and, and caused uh, around the world. And, and so when he, he, my father, in the early parts of that book, he just, he's telling a story about walking along with uh, T.F. Dreher and saying, you know, and, 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 and T.F. is telling him about all these like, you know, giant buffalo and these animals that are now extinct from Southern Africa um, that were even extinct from Southern Africa before Europeans arrived. And so, you know, and so my, my, my dad, I don't know how old he was, 12 years old or something, says, says to his grandfather, he goes, well, what happened to them? And of course, my great grandfather was speaking Afrikaans, but his answer was men happened to them. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and, you know, so, that, you know, and that was not a popular notion back then. I mean, I, I would go all the way through my high school still being perpetuated the myth that the ice age did it, right? You know, it, it, it wasn't, it was, you know, it, my, my, my grandfather was on a notion that was not going to grow popular for a very long time. But it did get me thinking a lot about that in terms of volume of meat eating. So when I think of volume of eating, I don't look at hunter-gatherer societies as being that helpful to us unless they're in Africa. What I mean is I don't really – it's not interesting to me what the Inuit eat. And it's not particularly interesting to me what the Aboriginal people in Australia eat because they're, they're immigrants. You know, I, my, my, I, I've kind of taken the view most of our evolution took place on the African continent. And so that's – that's where I, I've spent a fair bit of time with the Hadza, for example. I'm headed there in about two weeks and uh, to go hang out with them again. That to wow, me. That, that is so cool. It is. It's very yeah. neat. Yeah, no, your, your point is, is very well taken. And um, Boyd Eaton and, and many other people that have been involved in uh, this concept at the scientific level, not necessarily the, the, the popular level, believe that, um, and, I, and I agree with them, is that uh, that's really the model that we should look at is that uh, Homo sapiens genes were pretty much uh, shaped in Africa. Yeah. A little bit of shaping of our immune system that has occurred worldwide. Um, but everything pretty much the, the major physiology uh, was in place. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, we've actually published a paper looking at uh, the the food groups that are would would have been consumed by hominids living in Africa um, after our own species, Homo sapiens, evolved, and uh, um, it, it's it was an interesting uh, little paper, and, and they're all available at my website. You can go to my website, thepaleodiet.com, and and download PDFs of that. This paper we published in 2011 uh, with a lot of uh, well-known scientists. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'll definitely check that out. It's, um, I, I find it, uh, you know, the, the first time I got to go and hang out with the Hadza, it, to me, it's it honestly, it was like getting in a time machine, you know, it, and, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm sitting around a fire with these guys listening to them, you know, talking. Yeah, that, little, little the, click, the clicking language. Yeah, I've, I've spoken to uh, a, a few uh, anthropologists that have been with them and uh, I've never been in the field with a hunter gatherer. So I, you know, I, I, I view it, for me, it's kind of a chess game. It's you know, looking at things logically, but uh, you have to have people like yourself and, and anthropologists actually get in and do the field work because without those folks, um, we, we wouldn't have any good information. So uh, I, I'll, I'll give you a little, uh, I'll, I'll turn the tables a little. I'm asking you questions, but I put out a little social media post a couple of weeks ago that, hey, I'm going off to hang out with the Hadza again. And I'm quite known, I'm quite well known for that because I use stories of the Hadza in when I'm teaching business, marketing, and health. They 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 relate heavily. And I put this thing out on social media and said, Do you have a question for the Hadza? So if you've got one, I, I mean I've got questions from wow. you know, like John Gray from Mars Venus. I've got I've got questions from Tony Robbins. I'd love to have one from you. You don't have to come up with it on the spot unless it comes to you, but but I definitely would love to have one. Well, from what, Eric, what a wonderful offer. I'd have to give that some thought. Yeah, I figured. I figured. So no, I'm not yeah, looking for it right yeah. now. Yeah, no, I've, uh, you know, I can only, I can only imagine what it would actually be like because I've seen, uh, you know, s stuff on YouTube and it's just, it's fascinating to, yeah. to know that there are still people that can actually make a, a living in the, in the, their environment. Um, but boy, you know, it really creates an opportunity for me to test stuff. You know, when I read something that somebody's saying about, uh, you know, a, 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 an origin style diet, a paleo diet, that kind of thing, I'm, I, I, 
having been there, it, it's not difficult for me to, in my mind, go back into that situation and say, wow, does that really work in nature? And I, you know, for example, I read the, uh, I, my very first writing on this stuff was a book I wrote, I can't even remember when, like late 80s, early, no, 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 early, early mid 90s uh, called Dairy Delusion. And it was just a huge exploration into the history of dairy coming into our world and so on. And you can imagine, as I know the stuff you would have faced, I, 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 I mean, from my own family, I faced um, threats of violence. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but, well, you know, you know, I, 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 we still get those kind of comments is that, uh, you know, this is a, a dangerous diet to follow because it eliminates two food groups, uh, dairy and, and cereal grains. And, and actually, the, the opposite is true, is that uh, fruits, vegetables, meats, and uh, seafood are more nutritionally dense for the 13 vitamins and minerals most lacking in the typical U.S. diet. So by removing those, paradoxically, those two food groups, it actually increases nutrient density. And uh, I've pointed that out in the scientific literature, but uh, apparently those uh, nutritionists haven't read the, those papers. <laughs> yeah, it's phenomenal. When it, you know, you were talking before we got cut off the neck last time about nutritional density and the, and the choices that people make. And you might like this. I don't know if you'll, you'll have, you could use it, but this is the way I can describe that to people is you walk into a restaurant and they only have two items on the menu. One is a huge stir fry with a salad, all vegetables. And the other one is a, a nice big salmon steak or a big hunk of well-cooked bison, again, with some broccoli and, and vegetables. The question is, which one would most people order? They're going to go for the, for the high quality protein. I've asked this with, with audiences of a thousand people in the room. 90% of the hands go up for the steak or the fish, right? Nutritional density. But then yeah, that, you ask them a new question. Okay, you can have that, but you have to run around the block three times and do 50 push-ups. Now <laughs> which one will you do? And so yeah, no, now what happens, you've got to think about it. Geez, you know, today maybe I'm just not in the mood. I'll go with the salad. And and I, I sometimes think that, you know, there are that's where the cravings kick in. If you haven't if you haven't gone out for a hunt in a few days, you and I, are, you and I 100,000 years ago, I'm going, Lauren, dude, I just, I've got to have a hippo. You know, I think uh, that would be a good question to ask the Hazda is like, uh, you know, what, what would be their preference? If they could <clears throat> choose anything they wanted in their normal environment, what would they choose? Uh, assuming that they didn't have to, if we didn't look at I can tell you right now what it would be. It, I can tell you right now it would be meat and honey. Yeah, Those okay. guys are like crack addicts when it comes to honey. It's yeah, oh no, I agree. Yeah, they're not they're not um, lucky enough to be able to find it. Do you have you ever heard of a bird called the honey guide? Uh, I haven't. So it's a really cool bird. It, it um, th this is really neat. So it it flies along, and if it sees you, a, a hominid or a honey badger, nobody else, a hominid or a honey badger. Once it sees you, it it start, It's the little bird, and it just starts doing this with its wings until you look. It'll keep doing that until you look. As soon as you look, it starts flying, and you're supposed to follow it. You follow it, it will take you to a beehive. And wow. it's really fascinating. It only does it for people, which, of course, establishes the million year. I mean, that, that's not a, you know, Walt Disney didn't teach them that trick. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that is, that is, what a wonderful story. You know, I, um, your experience with the Hazda and honey is very similar to my uh, colleague, Kim Hill. And Kim Hill is a, an anthropologist, and he studied uh, people in South America rather than um, – then in Africa, he studied the, the Ashe hunter-gatherers. And so they were some of the last free-living hunter-gatherers uh, that kind of left the bush and uh, weren't uh, westernized until later on. And so he and his wife studied them. And he describes to me the same thing with honey, is that uh, when these Ashe hunter-gatherers uh, find a, a bee's nest that's loaded with honey, they'll go up there and they'll get stung like mad. And uh, he said he one time saw, and they eat everything. They eat the, the honey, the comb, the larva, the entire works. And he yeah. said it's not unusual to see a, a full-grown Ashe man eat maybe four or five pounds of honey at one setting. So, yeah, it's... But, but you the, know what's really fascinating? And the, the, again, this is the evolutionary relationship here. The honeys, the, the bees in Africa don't sting. Interesting. Yeah, right. they're, they're tiny little bees and they don't sting. And, and you see, if you're a bee and you evolved on a continent other than Homo sapiens continent, then you get lazy. You build your hive outside, you let it hang from the branch in plain view because stinging will keep your primary uh, predators away, non-tool holding predators. So you don't need to hide, you just sting. 
But if you're a bee and you evolve on on you know on the on the on the hominid continent, then you that's not going to work at all. They're going to smoke you out in two minutes. I mean, we've had fire for two million years, right? You know, they're going to smoke you out your toast. So the bees in Africa, they hide their hives deep inside the trees, and the only way to find them is there's a tiny, tiny little wax chimney. Honestly, I'm talking an inch long, at less than less than a fifth of an inch in diameter, and they 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 um, lengthen and shrink that chimney to control climate inside and what have you. And that chimney could be you know 10 feet up in the tree, so it's really hard to find honey in Africa. Um, and so that's why when they find it, they go crazy. But it's not. It's certainly not easy. Let me ask you another question, Eric, about your experience with the Hasda is uh, that I've got photographs that I use in some of my PowerPoint presentations, uh, you know, taken by other people that have obviously been with them. And uh, uh, it's my understanding that uh, the way the Hasda make <clears throat> fire is with a fire drill. Yep. A cylindrical piece of wood that goes down to another piece of wood. And, and I've done and it. So forth. And you have done I've it. Done and, it. And, and what I understand, I, talking to my uh, anthropologist, archaeologist friends, they say it's not an easy thing to do. No. You have to have a, you have to have a lot of um, tenacity, and uh, and you have to learn how to do it. So it takes. Uh, I uh, yeah, it is not easy. And I'll tell you that on the second or third day of trying to do it, like say you do it one day, you do it the second day, it your hands become so blistered uh, and sore. It, 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 of course, theirs don't because they're doing it every day, but it is not, uh, it, it really requires, you know, first of all, you got to have this speed. And then the second thing is you got to be putting downward pressure um, at the same time. So you're yeah. kind of going down the stick like this, creating downward pressure. So it's, it's, it takes some effort. Well, but you do it in a heartbeat. We, we, we're zooming along and they, they, they shoot a, a monkey, they grab it, they bring, maybe since people are watching this, they shoot something other than a monkey. And <laughs> although they do, they like monkeys, I'm sorry. And, and uh, you know, they, they, the minute they bring it down, you got one guy dealing with the monkey. As soon as the other guy knows that there's a monkey on the way, he's already rubbing the sticks. Like it's bad. <laughs> he's getting the fire going. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting things uh, we talk about what is and is not a contemporary uh, paleo diet is, is you can draw a line in the sand. And uh, one of the, the undeniable lines in the sand is the ability to make fire because uh, once we and not just to uh, collect it but to start it at will yeah and so once humans had evolved that ability or that technology then it opened up uh, foods that they couldn't have prior to that time consumed like uh, raw potatoes are basically indigestible because the starch needs to be hydrolyzed and broken down the same thing for legumes as legumes are um, inedible and actually even toxic unless they're cooked. So one of the ideas that I had and I've written about and have been in correspondence with other uh, anthropologists the world over is when did humans actually have the ability to start fire at will? And um, the best of able evidence suggests that uh, fire use um, first appeared regularly in Northern Europe about 300,000 years or so ago, even though in Africa there's a, a cave in Africa where it can uh, be dated back to even further than that, maybe 1.5 million. Uh, in all likelihood, those fires were gathered uh, from naturally occurring lightning fires. So uh, if you look at the Hasta and the way most hunter gatherers make fires with the fire drill, well, that technology. Um, if you didn't know about it, it wouldn't have been immediately obvious that you can sit here and do this. So they must have been must have occurred by accident, and they must have been doing something else, um, and they must have been drilling. So they were drilling to probably perforate to put a hole in a in an object, and by accident somebody saw that this produces fire if you do it long enough. Mm. So going back into the archaeological record is when do we first see perforated objects? And um, Neanderthals didn't have perforated objects. The other way to make fire is with a, a piece of iron called marcasite and flint. If you yeah. hit marcasite and flint together, it, it'll pr produce fire. But we don't find marcasite at these sites, these caves no. and, and so forth. So in Europe, anyway, it looks like 
friction with uh, drilling was, was probably part of it. And starting about 75 to 100,000 years ago in the archaeologic record, we first start to see bones and shells and things that are, have been drilled. So it seems likely, and we'll probably never know, but it seems likely that the, that technology, the fire drill, uh, occurred uh, serendipitously doing something else. Yeah. I, I have a couple thoughts. Well, one is you might want to look into um, Bob Brain, and I, my, my dad can point you in the right direction even better, and it's, it's, I'm sure it's in his book at megafauna.com. But the, uh, you know, Bob Brain did kiln tests on fire. You know, one of the ways they can tell whether or not fire is uh, being used, you know, or whether it's naturally occurring is um, how long something sat in a fire. So you can do yes. kiln tests to see, look, did this bone sit, was this bone just coincidentally in a forest fire, in which case it might have spent 15 or 20 minutes under, under blaze, or was this bone repeatedly in a fire for three days? Uh, yeah, and you can tell the molecular structure from that. And Bob Brain did kiln tests on, on bones um, and found uh, that not, we're not talking the creation of fire. Of course, that's a different issue. But the husbandry or the containment of fire dates back maybe two million years ago. And yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I, I think that uh, there's sporadic evidence, I mean, of, of people collecting naturally occurring fire that dates yeah. way back before they were able to uh, make it at will. But so. here, now here's, but this is interesting though, because let's say, I mean, I'm not sure how much, uh, I'm with you. One of the, one of the rules, you know, not, not rules, but one of the sort of tenets of, of, of our wild fit stuff is that if it must be cooked in order to be eaten, it is not food. Now it doesn't mean you should never ever eat it. I'm just saying, if you have to cook it to make it edible, then it wasn't actually ever edible. That's so right. That's, you might be on a similar wavelength there. Yeah, so, we're, we're completely on board with that. When I say draw a line in the sand, yeah. um, that's exactly what I'm saying is that, uh, believe it or not, red kidney beans, which are state Bad beans, news. It, yeah, if you try to eat red kidney beans uh, raw, they're, they're lethally toxic, not just making you sick, but uh, in, in rat models, you can, you can kill rats by giving them too much raw kidney beans. Yeah, it's funny. I think to a large degree, some of the advancements we've made have, have been great to prevent starvation, but really bad for long-term health. Like, you know, obviously figuring out grains says, hey, awesome, you can store calories. And so this winter won't be so bad. But at the same moment, what that does is create the possibility that you could be sick, but also the societal permission to be sick. You know, if, if a Hadza gets sick for two weeks, he's dead. He's, <laughs> nobody's feeding him. But yeah. if you've no, got grain stored up, now not only are you going to get sick, but it's actually okay to get sick because it's uh, there's food here. Well, when you think about grains or legumes, they're the they're seeds and they're the reproductive material of plants. And um, if those seeds don't get into the ground to make other new plants, then the species becomes extinct. Yeah. And so they didn't they didn't evolve seeds uh, to feed other animals. They evolved seeds. Uh, to reproduce their kind. And one of the evolutionary strategies that plants have taken is to evolve what are called anti-nutrients or secondary compounds. And that's what we find uh, in wheat. And uh, Gluten, enzyme blockers, hormone triggers, blah. Yeah, there's, all, there's all kinds of things. There's lectins, uh, wheat germ of gluten, and, um, as you mentioned, you know, gluten. And one of the, the, the things that plants have to do to make themselves toxic is they have to get into the physiology of an animal. And so that's a tough thing to do is unless they're ingested. And even if they're ingested, uh, they have to have compounds called protease inhibitors that prevent these enzymes in our gut from breaking down the proteins because you have to have intact proteins or peptides and they have to get past the gut barrier. So the second thing that they've evolved are these uh, compounds that increase intestinal permeability. So that allows large protein molecules to get past the gut, and that's when they do their damage. And so wheat contains uh, multiple compounds, one gluten, which increases intestinal permeability, and then two, it contains these other anti-nutrients that are, are pretty nasty. Wheat germ gluten is one, and there are others, thalmatin-like proteins, uh, that uh, are dangerous and that's the same way legumes work as well except yeah. instead of having gluten they have a compound called saponins and saponins break down membranes and all legumes 
are concentrated sources of saponins. And unless you cook them and degrade the saponins, then that's then you're not food. food. <laughs> yeah, so what you what you said is, is that if you have to cook it, it's not food. I, I like that. Yeah, it's a big part of what, you know, we, we have a number of different tests that, that we run, like, you know, when we're trying to figure out some semblance of truth for this. And that's one of them. If it must be cooked, it cannot possibly be necessary, and it probably is harmful. Yeah. yeah so. Now, your comments earlier on meat have stirred a couple of questions here. One of them comes from a very good friend of ours, uh, Osa. And from Sweden, and she's uh, she actually. I'm just about to go to Africa with her. Funny enough, she's not coming to see the Hadza, but she's climbing Kilimanjaro with me. Oh, but, you know, you're such a peripatetic world traveler. I wish I could go even some of these exotic places. Hey, I, honestly, you ever want to go and check out the Hadza with me? You're welcome. I, I'd love to have you. I think you, it's something that you would uh, that would add a lot of value to what you're doing in the world. So uh, if you ever want to do that, I'm going again next year around this time in 2016. Well, I'll, I'll, I, honestly, I'll send you some information. I'd love to have you. I better, I better get around to doing that before I die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's important. Well, you know, and and I, 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 there's a bit of a race on because how I don't know how much they're, longer they're going to be around either. The uh, Tanzanian government is working very hard to assimilate them, and resistance is futile. But uh, <laughs> but Osa's uh, question, you know, I think the comment about the the meat calories, um, you know, she's kind of going, whoa, that's a lot of meat, and we don't. It normally in our programs recommend that that volume of meat for a number of reasons but what it stimulates for me is a question about do you perceive there to be a difference in the uh, requirement uh, uh, of meat between men and women you know I've written about this extensively in the scientific literature and um, our group was the the first group to really uh, what do you want to say promulgate the notion that protein is toxic so Believe it or not, we do have a physiologic protein ceiling, and I've explained it in a couple of our scientific papers, uh, the one in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2000. And so um, protein can be toxic if you eat about well, perhaps 30 to 40 percent of your total calories. And women, when they become pregnant, um, actually their protein ceiling uh, is reduced. And so... Uh, I've written about this as well, and so uh, it's not a good idea for women to eat high levels of protein when they're pregnant. So we're suggesting about 25% of calories. My colleague John Speth from the University of Michigan and I have written about this. Uh, so if, if she's interested, um, uh, just have her give me an email and I'll make sure that I get that scientific paper to her. So. Um, so what do hunter-gatherers have to do? You can talk to the, that would be the question I would ask the Hazda is that, can you eat too much meat? Is it toxic? Are they aware of it? And one of the strategies that hunter-gatherers have done is they use selective butchering. So if they get a real lean animal, um, they tend to prefer the fattier parts of the carcass. Yeah. Um, and so uh, fat, like, we in the Western world are, are unaware of uh, the retroorbital fat behind the eyes. Uh, believe it or not, the tongue is one of the favorite uh, organs for hunter-gatherers. And uh, I've work, watched. Yeah, and, and so work from our laboratory actually shows that tongue is about 60 to 70 percent fat calories, and it's a type of fat called monounsaturated fat, which is like what's found in nuts and, and olive oil. So it's a pretty good stuff. The marrow is absolutely favored and uh, you know, yeah, they love been, it. From, been from the very earliest times, uh, two and a half million years ago, uh, we, the archaeologic record shows that people were cracking open long bones and extracting marrow. And, and marrow is a very good source of fat as well. It's yeah. actually preferred. And I'm sure you know that you, when you're in the field watching these guys eat. Oh, yeah. Guys. No, no. They're, they're, they're sucking every bone that they break it open, no question. But, uh, but, but anecdotally, so I can't, I can't address the more scientific notion around, uh, you know, meat eating for men and women. But anecdotally, I can tell you, when I go hunting with the Bushmen, we go out, we get something. Uh, if we're far from camp, not much of that gets back to camp. And honest to goodness, we shoot something. It, we, we take it out of, you know, we, we're making a fire. And, and we're eating it, and we eat it right then and there, and then we don't talk about it when we get back to camp. I mean, we, we may as well have stopped off at a strip club because we are not talking about the meat that we stopped and had on the way back from the, the, the you know. It's, and the only time that I've seen meat come back to uh, camp 
and I don't say village because of course they're nomadic and they don't really you know stay in one place but the only time I've seen meat come back to the camp is when it is uh, is when they've scored something significant uh, and more commonly is when they happen to catch something very close to camp like when you can pretty much hear camp and they kill a bird then the bird goes to camp my my own observation is that women in the camp are eating I want to say less than 10% of the total meat that the men are eating. Now, I don't know if that's consistent through time or if that's something that's more specific now to the Hadza, but it, I found it interesting. Yeah, we've, uh, we've actually compiled, um, you know, the Hadza have been observed, observed in the ethnographic literature, just like what you're doing. And uh, they've been observed by anthropologists who try to take a shot at how much plant and how much animal food they're eating. And um, it's, it's variable. We have, I know in, in the paper that we compiled that uh, with um, John Speth and others, um, I, I think it, it actually was the Hasda and the, the Kung and, and others have a fairly high plant um, intake compared to their animal food intake. So Well, and, and I think that w when I made the comment earlier about being a little concerned about looking at, um, at you know, hunter gatherers in other places, like something we, I, I'm not, sh I, I'm sure you're familiar with this stuff, but uh, did, were you familiar with uh, Doc, uh, Paul Martin at the University of Arizona? Yes, I know, I yeah. know Paul. Yeah, so he, he actually wrote the foreword for my dad's book and he, um, you oh, know. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And so they, um, the, the, the uh, you know, his work and, and of course related to my grandfather's work was really, you know, what happened to the 11 or 12 elephant or let's say pachyderm species that were living in North America before humans arrived? What happened to all the mammoths and mastodons that lived in and, and related, uh, you know, woolly rhinos and such? I mean, I've been to the Lascaux Caves. It's always fascinating to me walk into the Lascaux Caves and there's a painting of a rhino in France. What's going on? Yeah. And, you know, so one of the yeah. things that concerns me is can you imagine what it would have been like for, you know, again, you and I, time machine, boom, 200,000 years ago, walk in the, into one of these places where no humans have ever been. The animals have no flight avoidance. They, they don't know what a bipedal hunter looks like. They're not afraid of them in the least. Early European explorers talk about arriving in these places and being able to walk up and touch the birds. And so you got to think their meat intake would have been really hot until they killed everything. Ah, I think we lost our connection again. Guys, I uh, I think we, we went, I, I, I took the thing over time anyway because of all the connection losses we've had. Um, I know there are still some more questions that were that need to get answered in here. So I apologize for all the technical challenges we had. I'm not sure what's going on there, but I will definitely uh, talk to Dr. Cordain about coming back and having another chat with us again. I found this fascinating. I hope you guys have. Um, and uh, I, with that, I'm going to uh, sign off and go um, say goodbye to, well, try and get a hold of them to say goodbye. Thanks very much for tuning in and uh, keep an eye out. We'll, we'll definitely have a more successful part two, uh, maybe when the winter is a little bit further along in America. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, we'll see you at another time for another round of uh, a Wild Talks. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.